Um, Great. Well, so uh, I was having a t conversation uh, with William McCaskill here um, uh, a, a couple of months ago in in London, and it was basically about lunar settlement, and and I guess he was a little bit skeptical of some of it, and and by the end of it, he was like, well, that's not so ridiculous, and so um, and then he was like, oh, we'll come and speak about this uh, at the, at this conference um, I organised, and I'm happy to do that. Um, so I'm going to be talking about lunar settlement and um, the, the, the reasons for doing that. And I'd really love, uh, the reason I, I wanted to do this talk was really to get feedback on whether or not it really helps solve some of the existential threats for humanity that is the motivation in my mind for putting a settlement on the moon. Um, so yeah, my name is Will Marshall. I, I, what I do as a day job is run Planet Labs. We do these satellites that do Earth imaging. Um, so we have 192 satellites up there imaging the whole Earth every day. Um, it's, uh, so, so I'm really focused on this planet primarily, uh, but uh, I do think and care a little bit about other planets and what we might do there. Um, and um, yeah, so, so here we are. Um, this, is, uh, this is what we're talking about. Uh, the moon, um, it's, uh, it's really the obvious place uh, to put uh, uh, the uh, settlement off Earth, the first of, uh, place to put a settlement off Earth. Um, it's just a, a day or two travel time away. It's one light second uh, in, in time uh, to communicate, so you can actually have real-time communications, unlike with most of the destinations, um, uh, which makes, uh, facilitates learning on, in an active way much, much faster. Um, it has plentiful resources. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and it doesn't have an atmosphere. An atmosphere is a bit of a pain in the ass once you become a spacefaring species. Um, it's, a, it's really handy when you're not, but once you are, it inhibits you getting off and onto planets, and the moon doesn't have a... Uh, atmosphere is actually a massive advantage. Um, it makes it really simple to land and get back off. And finally, it almost certainly doesn't have life, and one of the challenges I, I wrestle with my fellow space colleagues on about Mars, apart from all the technical reasons it's much harder to settle Mars, um, is uh, than the moon, you know, like it's a thousand times harder technically, but also is that Mars may have extant life, we don't know yet, and we've done a really good job of fucking up life here on planet Earth, and, and I don't think it's a good thing to wipe out other species, particularly if they might have a separate genesis, and, that, and, and therefore, the moon is, in my opinion, by far and away the obvious place to put a settlement. And I have thought that for some time, and uh, this German uh, physicist put it really well. If God wanted man to become a spacefaring species, he would have given man a moon. Yeah, it's staring us in the fucking face. I mean, it's literally there in the sky, uh, the size of the sun in angular diameter, and there it sits. And by the way, he doesn't believe in God. He's a physicist, and we use this sort of metaphorically. Um, but, uh, and, and, and it really is uh, pretty, pretty much there for the having, the size of Africa in land area staring us right nearby. Um, small cosmic advert, um, just in case you guys aren't aware, <laughs> there is this eclipse happening in a few days' time, um, in, in fact, a, a week uh, tomorrow, um, it goes across the U.S., uh, it is the most amazing uh, event you can see on this planet. Um, if you haven't been to one, I highly, highly recommend it. You have to actually get on the eclipse path. You can't get on the nearby, like down here. 98% of eclipse is nothing like a real eclipse. You have to get in the actual path of totality. If you do, you'll uh, see how and why people go eclipse chasing all around the planet um, every year. Anyway, back to the moon. There's two particular things that have happened that are really uh, make this much easier than it was just 10 years ago to settle this body. The first is this. Um, I was on the science team for this particular mission when we were at NASA. We sent a small probe to the south pole of the moon uh, looking for water. Uh, and uh, we did, in fact, find a large quantity of water. We found about 6% by mass in the regolith in, in volatile form, so little ice crystals in the regolith. Um, now, why hadn't humans found water on the moon, given the 73 prior missions to the moon, uh, you might ask? Um, well, it was uh, because they'd basically been looking in the wrong place. The moon um, it, it, uh, it spins on an, on an axis almost exactly perpendicular to the ecliptic plane, unlike the Earth that is tilted at 23 degrees, given us the seasons. 
is tilted almost zero degrees, 0.6 degrees, from the, uh, the, eclipse, the ecliptic plane, which means that if you're on a hilltop on the poles, you see light all the time, peaks of eternal light. And if you're in a trough down nearby them, you are in permanent shadow. And where we impacted this particular probe, it was been in shadow for 2 billion years. It was 40 Kelvin temperature, pretty chilly. Um, and uh, it had lots of volatiles. Basically, comets landed there, lots of ice and other things. Also, there was CO2, methane, light hydrocarbons of other kinds, um, nitrates, lots of it as well. Um, we only sample one location, but simple extrapolations suggest that there's enough water for millions of people for thousands of years to live uh, a very, very uh, fulfilled life there. And so water on the moon is super important because water is the main consumable that humans use. It's useful for three things. One, drinking. Two, turning into oxygen and hydrogen. And you can breathe the oxygen, and you can make fuel out of hydrogen and oxygen. So electrolysis, which of course you can do with solar panels, and water um, makes for the vast majority of human consumables out of the gate. So the fact that there's 6% of it in the soil ready to pick up is super handy. The second thing that has happened is that there's this company called SpaceX that has built some rockets. And it's really pretty uh, phenomenal what they have done. Um, and this one in particular, this rocket actually doesn't exist, but it's very, very soon to exist. Um, it's meant to do its first launch in November. Um, the main rocket in the middle is the Falcon 9, and this is the one where they strap two uh, extra first stages on the side of said Falcon 9. Falcon 9 is the regular workhorse of SpaceX. Um, and and so very soon we'll have this rocket, which um, can launch about 50 tons uh, of mass to low Earth orbit, which is about half the throw mass of the Saturn V. But for reasons I can explain with a trick um, that I keep on uh, uh, explaining to people, you can put humans onto the lunar surface and get them back with this rocket today, which is really remarkable um, because here we are um, with the capacity in private hands to send humans uh, to the lunar surface today. So these two things really help. So what the fuck are we doing here? Well, what we're doing is, I think, trying to set up a self-sustainable settlement off Earth with a backup of all human life, like a seed bank, and a backup of human knowledge. Basically, what I envision is a, a small settlement, a bit like a biosphere 2 on the moon, uh, 10 to 15 people grow, lo growing all their own food, living off the land, so to speak, uh, with all the critical resources to be able to, and, and equipment, to be able to mend all the life uh, critical infrastructure that's there, i.e. such that if a calamity happened on Earth, they'd be able to keep on going there without help from the Earth. And so that's the goal, and I mean to tell you a little bit about how fe feasible this goal is today. This is essentially the vision. Uh, this is the Biosphere 2 uh, project in, in, in Phoenix, uh, or outside Phoenix, uh, uh, no, in Arizona. Um, and this is a stupendous uh, experiment, and it was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen and widely misunderstood. In, there was basically a, um, a, a greenhouse in the desert where eight people lived. It, it was hermetically sealed, so no oxygen or anything from inside to outside just light um, from the sun, and uh, they grew their own food and lived there for two years um, in, this, in this closed facility. Our job on the moon is essentially to recreate this on the moon, um, except uh, it's a little bit easier in a certain sense. It's hard, obviously, because you have to get it there, but it's easier in the sense that um, you can be much more compact because you don't have to have complete 100% uh, recycling of everything, because you can bring in local water, local oxygen, local uh, uh, um, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, nitrates, and so forth. You can have much more intense farming. So this whole volume, and there's several other, uh, other pieces of this uh, facility that you don't need. Um, and, and so you can make this much smaller on the moon and much more tractable to move there. And in fact, I estimate that you need, uh, of course, you can try and make a lot of the material pits of it there. There's aluminum ore bauxite on the moon, there's a lot of the other materials, and your silica to make glass. Uh, so what you'd really do is bring the machinery necessary to build those things. You bring a temporary hab to get going, but you would build, bring the machinery necessary to build that. Now, why are we doing this? And this is what I wanted to talk mostly uh, with this audience about. Uh, and in particular, why are we doing this when we've got lots of problems down here on Earth? I'm asked this question often. 
Why are we going to space when we have all these problems on Earth? And I actually think the thrust of the question is a good one. Um, because I think we should be spending most of our energies here on Earth. This is where most of the problems are. This is where we have malnutrition and, and uh, war and disease and, and uh, you know, all the sustainable development goals that we care and should be focusing most of our attention on. And I think 99.99% of our energy should be focused on trying to help that. Space, um, uh, it, 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 you know, uh, so that's my first thought when people ask me that. But, but I, I, I then do, of course, explain that space can actually help us with that challenge. And it, um, uh, it can help us with the sustainable development goals. It can help us to understand. And in fact, most of our understanding of climate change, for example, comes from satellites. Our ability to help uh, with teleeducation, telemedicine, help improve crop yields with um, data from Earth imaging satellites, like the kind of satellites we have at Planet, um, can really help these matters here on Earth. So, it's, and, and sometimes it's a bit like you have to get off the planet, just like you have to go out of your country to understand your own country. You have to get off the planet to understand your planet. And in very much that is the case. If we want to help ourselves on this planet, we need to get off it a little bit. That's still to help Earth. But here I'm really talking about getting off the planet not to help the lives all down here on Earth, but to help life more broadly. Um, and I, I will say that at Planet, my day job, that is our intent, is using satellites to help um, uh, people and, and lives here on the Earth. Uh, but but the, these are the four main reasons we might, uh, might go to the moon. Um, science is one of the reasons people talk about, obviously. Uh, you can do interesting scientific things, like it's very radio quiet on the black side of the moon because um, you're shielded from the Earth. You might just do it for exploration. People say, oh, it's in our genes. You might do it to back up humanity. Um, that's sort of what I already mentioned. And society, you can do it to start. It's a clean slate for new political systems. You can imagine new economic systems. It's expanding our e economic sphere. There's lots of reasons to do it. But I really th am focused on this one, which I think is by far and away the overwhelming reason to put a settlement on the moon and to do so very soon. And let me talk about it in particular related to that problem. What is the effect of having a lunar ba backup on various threat scenarios? And I'm going to talk about threat scenarios and, and, and how the lunar settlement can help. I mean, you, know, you could talk about ha uh, threat scenarios that wipe out all of life, that wipe out just humanity, and that wipe out just human civilization, say, set us back 500 or 1,000 years. And then we can talk about how a lunar backup could reduce that risk. Okay, and so that's the thing I want to go through. And the first thing I, you talk about is asteroids. So, you know, actually, um, so an asteroid impact affects all three of these. Like the asteroid wiped out m most of life on Earth with the, uh, with the dinosaurs, etc. Uh, so it might wipe out 90% of the asteroids. We're talking about a big asteroid a couple of kilometers of across, like the one that wiped out the asteroids. It would wipe out most of humans, but not all humans. Some humans would definitely survive um, because we're pretty in innovative. A civilization would almost certainly be wi wiped out. Uh, a backup on the moon really helps a lot because a, an asteroid is extremely unlikely to hit the Earth and the moon. <laughs> Two separate asteroids at the same time uh, would have to be on a cunning uh, 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 collusion plan uh, to, to come up with that. And so we really solve that problem quite substantively, going from you know, something like 10 to the minus 7 per year to way less, actually probably less than that. Um, so that's, that's a good one. It can help with that one. But that's actually one of the least likely of the risks facing humanity. Most of the risks facing humanity are the ones that we bring upon ourselves, as you're probably all aware. So let's talk about uh, the other four major threats facing humanity and how they can help. So nuclear war um, would wipe out actually most of humans, uh, but not all of them, so more like that. Sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, it would wipe out most life. This is where two countries, say, get into a nuclear exchange. They, they nuke each other with more than 100 nukes. We go into a nuclear winter. And... Um, it would wipe out civilization. It wouldn't wipe out all humans, but it would wipe out most of them. It wouldn't wipe out all life, but it would wipe out most of them. Um, a backup on the moon really helps. People, in principle, could nuke the moon as well. But most of the threat scenarios are countries that accidentally sort of go into a nuclear exchange, and there it's very unlikely that it happened to send a nuke to the moon, not least because no one's got a nuke on a rocket that can get to the moon right now. Um, and so it's very unlikely it would happenstance he affect the moon. So it's very likely under most threat scenarios that the lunar settlement would survive. Even if a party decided they wanted to nuke the moon at the same time, which is pretty unlikely, it would take them years to put a nuke onto a rocket that could get to the moon. No one has that right now. And that's a good thing. So that reduces that thread, and perhaps you could do something like 
let's chill out, guys, and uh, in the meantime. So I actually think that reduces that threat pretty substantively. Bioterrorism, which I think is perhaps one of the worst threats that we have today, maybe only with the exception of rogue AI as being uh, more likely. Um, Bioterrorism is, you know, somebody releases a pathogen with a six-month delay that no one has a cure for in Heathrow, and six months later, everyone dies. Okay. Unfortunately, this is where somebody has an intent on trying to wipe out all of humans. And where they have that said intent, they would equally potentially have the intent of doing that on that lunar settlement. Any packages that are going there, they might try and infiltrate and get it there. So it has less of an effect. It could reduce it, but it's less, you know, just because it's hard to get it there. And you can have some quarantine and other things on the moon that make it harder, but not impossible for the bio threat to get through. Climate change, well, it will help in the sense that it will back up all the different species, um, but it won't uh, help in the sense that it's probably going to happen anyway, and it's very little this is going to do to change that. And then the rogue AI, this is where you know, a, 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 an artificial general intelligence doesn't have humanity as part of its objective function or even, um, it, 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 uh, and, and therefore either deliberately or accidentally uh, wipes out uh, life, um, which you know, really affects all three of these columns. I think space doesn't really help very, uh, lunar settlement wouldn't help very much here because, you know, it wipes out all life on Earth and then one nanosecond later it does that for the moon and the rest of the solar system. I mean, the problem is that at that point, uh, the, the moon is not going to be hard for it to uh, bring down to. I think it helps only in that potentially that the AI just jumps to like, okay, well, we'll just take over that next galaxy. It's just as easy as the moon, you know? But I think generally this is not going to uh, uh, help the AI threat um, uh, in as much as there is one. I do believe there is an AI threat, uh, but um, um, so uh, my summary is that um, um, the lunar backup significantly reduces existential threats and uh, really substantive. It doesn't eliminate any. No, no mechanism does eliminate any, but it does, it does help. Uh, and I would say also, by the way, on AI, I think one of the interesting things, although AI represents an existential threat, most people don't acknowledge on the other side, if it doesn't <laughs> decide to wipe us out or accidentally wipe us out, it almost certainly will solve all the other existential threats for us. And <laughs> because it will be a piece of cake for it to do so. Um, and so, interestingly, I'm of the opinion that the net effect of AI Statistically, I don't. I prefer not to take the risk, but statistically, it's more likely to help existential threats facing humanity and other life uh, than uh, than to reduce them. But anyway, that's a, 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 a sort of a, another topic. Um, but so I do think it can potentially help these existential threats. So how the hell will we do this? Let me talk a little bit more about that. So we need some spacecraft to go and survey the sites, where to put the, um, the settlement, um, which bits crater, so forth, um, comms and nav systems, water and oxygen production facilities, the rockets to transport the humans there, analogs. This is where you spend time here on Earth iterating biospheres, uh, like Biosphere 2, but trying to minimize the mass so that you can fit it into a few rockets. Um, and, and I do think it can be fit in just a, a few. Um, the vaults, uh, this is where you plan what data, what uh, 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 different species, how you're going to put them in a way that is uh, going to survive for a long time on the moon. Um, and, and you take a sort of agile engineering approach. Um, I talk just a little bit more. I'm not going to go through each of these. Um, the rocket piece, I, would, I just want to talk a little bit more about that. So. I already mentioned the Falcon Heavy is about half the flow mass of the Saturn V, and the Saturn V was very much on the margins of getting two people onto the lunar surface and back. So how the hell are we talking about doing it with that rocket? The real simple trick is uh, to use local oxygen. Oxygen makes up the vast majority of the mass of a rocket, uh, over two-thirds of the starting mass of a rocket, the whole rocket, including the fuel, the, 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 so the o fuel oxidizer, the structure, and the payload. The vast majority of the mass is the oxygen. So if you can use local oxygen to refuel your tanks just for the return leg, you can send humans onto the lunar surface and back in a Dragon capsule and a direct descent mission, much simpler than the Apollo where they staged and had a piece uh, still in lunar orbit with one person in and then went back and docked with it. That saves you some mass, but it adds complexity and I'm all for simplicity. This is a direct des descent. So the Falcon Heavy would literally inject the Dragon onto a lunar trajectory, 
it would descend onto the lunar surface and it would ascend back off with the humans and straight to the Earth. No staging of, of, of with other um, uh, components left in various orbits. So it makes it really, really simple, but you have to use local oxygen. So, of course, you, you plan, you, you get some water, you split it into oxygen and hydrogen, you, you have a, bow, you know, a, a, a bank of, of, of oxygen there on the moon, which you keep in a cold place. There's lots of cold places, uh, as we discussed and then you put it into the rocket and you come back. If you can do that, it simplifies the architecture massively and you can do it with today's rocket, a rocket that we have today. You don't need a super, drag, a super heavy, whatever they call it, uh, the Falcon X. You can actually do it with the rocket we've basically got today, which is the Falcon Heavy. Um, this is the series of missions one would want to take. I calculated that one needs to take about 30 to 40 kilograms, sorry, tons of stuff to the lunar surface to put up this settlement. I figured out all the things, not just the, the maker habitat, but I listed all the ingredients you need uh, for the machinery to mend the airlock hinge door when that breaks or the whatever, and to, do, and to mend the machinery that you need to <laughs> mend that. Um, and f in my rough estimate, 30 to 40 tons is what you need, which equates to about five launches of a Falcon Heavy, plus you need the human missions to get going and so forth. Um, and so, so that you, you, this is the sequence that you would do, and you would, of course, build it up. It's essentially like going to Burning Man and living off the land there, building all your stuff, except in this case, you have, you know, maybe 20 trucks load of stuff to bring. And in this case, you really have to fucking live there. Like, not just bring all your water and stuff. You really have to, you can bring some, but, like, you really have to dig it out of the soil, and it's about the same moisture content as a desert, by the way. And so it's actually possible to bring it out, but it's not, like, it's trivial, and you have to bring your seeds and grow your plants and actually eat it. It's going to be harder. It's going to be much harder core than Burning Man, for those of you that are going to this event in the desert. Uh, how much is it going to cost? Well, the simple... Um, uh, cost of all the rockets, uh, the spacecraft that you need, the habs and analogs on the ground, the, the vaults, the, sorry, the formatting is a little bit fucked up here, um, is about a billion dollars. Um, I always like to times things by pi um, x um, when we're talking about such audacious and outrageous projects as backing up all of humanity and life and human knowledge. Um, so that's the three billion. But holy fuck, three billion, okay, that's nothing. Like, I have dozens of friends that could do that with their spare change, like, what the fuck? <laughs> Why not? Okay, a few billion we can put up a backup of humanity and all life. Um, seems like a plan. Um, how long is it gonna take? Well, roughly five years, even if it took 10 years, okay, no big deal. Um, so, for five to 10 years, uh, for under three billion dollars, we can reach this goal of a self-sustainable set on the on the off Earth with backup of life and human knowledge. And the only question is, is that does that is that worth it for the effects that it has on these, you know, existential uh, risks, right? Um, and and you know that that I personally I think is an overwhelming, yeah. And so that's where I'll leave it with you today. Thanks very much for listening. Now, we have a good five minutes for questions, and I've told um, we're open to questions, and I certainly want to take some. So, yes. Uh, yeah, back. so a backup is only as good as your restore plan? As, as your what? As your restore plan? Uh, yeah, well, sure. Mm -hmm. So, like, what, what's your plan? Like, if one of these risks happens, like, what do we, how does that help us restore? Well, so they are self-sustainable there on the moon. Um, so, and of course, if they're 1% more than self-sustainable, they can ultimately expand anywhere they want. Uh, meaning that if they've got all of human knowledge and they can bit mend everything there, they can ultimately come back on the Earth or go wherever else they wish to go. Um, personally, I don't think it would make sense to go back to the Earth, I mean, once you're a space-faring species. But in any case, and, and a lot of people get confused about economic sustainability versus technological sustainability. I'm talking about technological sustainability. And as soon as you have technological sustainability, you by definition have economic sustainability. Um, so if you can live off the land, you don't need an income from anywhere else. Um, so 
yeah, I, I think as soon as you've got just that and just a tiny weeny bit more, within a thousand years, you can settle wherever you want. Yes, at the front. So yeah. you can yeah. be outside of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, what consideration have you given so far to the high energy? Uh, uh, Most, I, a lot of work has been done, of course, in lunar settlements. I'm not the first person to think about this. and. Uh, uh, most of the settlement designs that the European Space Agency and NASA and others have put together involve putting uh, um, uh, essentially these sort of domes with, with regolith you pile over the top of about a meter of regolith. Water turns out to be a great uh, absorber of neutrons and other radiation that you, you get bombarded with. Yeah, so, and you live under the ground most, most likely for this reason. Um, yes? So you said 10 to 15 people? Yeah. And that seems to me like putting a, a, a time span on the restoration plan, right? Because 50 people, like, how long do they live? Another 40 years after? Right? Well, obviously, they can shag. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. just 50 yeah. people, so you don't have enough genetic diversity. Uh, yes, but you can bring in a, a sperm bank and an egg bank very easily as well. And so genetic diversity isn't your challenge. There is, but I think you are touching towards perhaps the only obvious uh, challenge that is not clear to me about this plan, which is, um, are the progeny of these humans viable um, when they're born in one-sixth gravity? For adult humans, it's obviously not going to be a problem because with one-sixth gravity compared with zero gravity in the, on the space station, you can wear just some weights, if you like. You can wear a lead-lined suit all around all the day and have basically the equivalent of um, mass on the Earth. But of course, once you, when you're first born, it's not clear what exactly is going to happen. What's going to happen with zero G uh, during the pregnancy and things like this? That is, I think, the, one of the biggest unknowns about this, uh, or when it's sixth G, sorry. And I, I, I do worry about that. And there's a very good chance that they wouldn't be able to, the progeny wouldn't be able to get back and live on the Earth's gravity. That might not be a problem in that scenario, right? Or at least that's not the end of the world in that scenario. But it, it, that is a significant issue. Are they going to be viable generally to then procreate beyond that? And that, so I think that's an important question, which I, I don't have an answer for. Yes? Uh, yeah, so I've looked at uh, quite a lot of disaster scenarios. Yes. And I don't think they're going to happen the way that uh, you seem to be picturing. OK. I mean, uh, especially civilization collapse seems very unlikely and very hard to get yeah. uh, outside of certain bio or AI scenarios. And I don't actually think that having a backup on the moon is going to be all that useful. However, mm -hmm. I think that the skills you get by building the backup on the moon mm -hmm. may be very useful on Earth. I, I'm still not sure I understand. So, um, what I mean is, you could put a lunar, you could put a biosphere to, in yeah. various places on the Earth, and yeah. in most disasters, including nuclear war, uh, even with a bad nuclear winter, this is just as survivable or more survivable than on the Moon. Right. The skills you develop there would allow you to survive communities on Earth in large numbers, yeah. which is probably a better basis uh, to rebuild from. Yeah, I, and, and by the way, when I was talking about the deltas of the lunar settlement, I meant compared with things we could do on the Earth, like the Svalbard seed bank and stuff. So I actually think that there is delta there. Um, but I, I guess I'd love to ask, you know, which, which t tell me a threat scenario that you think I suggested that, there's, um, that th this helps, that it doesn't. Let's dive into one. Oh, nuclear war, for instance. Yeah. So what about, so, so and, and about the, its effect on life or humans or... Or, or civilization? On, on humans and on civilization, um, mm -hmm. the, there just are not enough nukes to kill any, everyone. Or, yes. Well, I mean, there is enough if everybody stands in big circles where they drop right. the nukes, but... No, I agree uh, it won't kill humans, and uh, yeah, I then also said that. If, that. You, if you get a nuclear winter scenario, which is not, we, there's great uncertainties about that, you're still going to find lots of places on the Earth that are still survivable. Yes. Uh, until the but civilization would surely be massively. Civilizations impact. don't die easily. Okay, so I'd, I'd love to I'd love to continue that conversation with you potentially afterwards. Any other questions? We've got just one minute left. Yes. Um, Ten to fifteen people doesn't sound very uh, appealing to, to go to. Can <laughs> you calculate like how much more money it would be to, to bring more people? 
Well, uh, yeah, it costs like, you know, of order 10 million bucks per person or something like that. But um, there's plenty of people that would do it. I mean, you go to any space geekery conference and ask the question, would you take a one-way trip to the moon? You would literally get... Uh, so I'm not worried about volunteers, but you're right. I mean, ultimately, it might get a bit lonely, um, and, and having more people there would be better and more sustainable. And I just went for the, what's the minimal thing, uh, both from a cost and a time perspective. Okay, I, I better wrap up. Okay, one, one very last question. Go on then. Uh, it seems to me that it's probably most likely this would be a very multilateral approach. Yes. Do you see any advantage to maybe a unilateral uh, uh, movement like, say, just China, just the US? Oh, I don't think this should be a nation state thing at all. Uh, I think it can be purely a non profit organization that does this with someone donating them a couple of billion dollars. And I, I, so, organizationally, um, I, and that would. If you had a nation state involved, it wouldn't take uh, five years or 10 years or $3 billion. You can 10x those things f f without even beginning. <laughs> okay, I better wrap up. Thanks very much for your time, guys.